welcome back. Hope we had a, a nice break and a chance to uh, visit with uh, friends, and we'll have more opportunity for that uh, uh, after uh, we hear from our next speaker, uh, who is Joni L. Kinsey, uh, who earned her Ph.D. from um, Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri in 1989. She is a professor of art history at the University of Iowa, where she has been uh, since uh, 19... Uh, 91. Uh, over the last 30 years, uh, much of her research is concentrated on the artist Thomas Moran. Um, and um, she uh, is the author of two books, uh, especially uh, germane to uh, our topic today. 1992, she wrote Thomas Moran and the Surveying of the American West which was published by the Smithsonian Institution Press. Uh, and followed that in 2006 with Thomas Moran's West, Chromolithography, High Art, and Popular Taste. She regularly teaches courses in American Landscape and Art of the American West at the University of Iowa. She's recently developed a course entitled Art in America's National Parks. No wonder we invited her to be with us today. Uh, her topic is, uh, I think, uh, I think of Charlton Heston. Behold the wonders. Thomas Moran's Yellowstone art. Joni Kinsey. Thank you so much for that nice introduction. It's always a pleasure to be here in Cody. Uh, thank you to all of you who invited me and for those of you who have attended. Uh, my, I have great fondness for this place and it dates back to 1975 when I was a 16 year old Girl Scout and was fortunate to attend a national camp that started here in Cody uh, about 75 girls from all over the country assembled here and took off on a backpack trip through the uh, Sunlight Basin near Yellowstone. And it was so formative in my life, I know it had a factor in my ultimate choice of subject matter for my career and uh, a number of other trips west did as well, but uh, always coming back to Cody is a, is a great thrill. So thank you so much. Also, I want to give Peter Hasrick a bit of credit too. His work has been so influential in uh, shaping my understanding of the American West, and I appreciate that tremendously. So, uh, although many uh, artists have portrayed the Yellowstone region over the past century and a half, few are as fundamentally linked with the area as Thomas Moran, a landscape painter who traveled as a guest artist in 1871 with the first federal expedition of the region. The images he made that summer, and these are not those first ones, but um, we will see them along the way, helped convince Congress to establish Yellowstone as the first national park the following spring in early 1872. And those pictures and his subsequent work, which is what you're seeing here, just a, a fraction of it, over the next 40 years was enormously influential on shaping Americans' appreciation of the area. Moran's huge oil paintings, exquisitely detailed watercolors, and a wide array of printed images helped shift Yellowstone's reputation from its early reputation as the place where hell bubbled up to a wonderland that people wanted to visit. And his work also helped establish what became the essential itinerary in the park, the must-see destinations. Moran himself was so closely associated with the place that he was sometimes called Tom Yellowstone Moran, and he adopted a distinctive signature that added a Y to the T and M of his initials. Just as important, Moran's art not only reveals a great deal about Yellowstone, but also emphasizes the ways in which art has shaped perceptions of the national parks more generally. As we celebrate the centennial of the National Park Service this year, established in 1916, 
It's especially interesting to consider the origin of the parks that preceded the establishment of that agency. And as Moran's story shows, it's important to recognize that the very first of these, Yellowstone National Park, was established through the unique alliance of government, business, and art. Thomas Moran was born in Bolton, England to ham lo hand loom weavers in 1837, and his family emigrated to the United States when he was just seven. He was apprenticed to an engraving firm in Philadelphia as a teenager, but he was better at drawing than at carving the blocks, and soon was allowed to draw images for others to engrave. Staying close to Philadelphia throughout the 1850s, Moran began seeking an independent artist, artistic career, sketching the woods and rivers of the area. His style of this period is one of a young painter emulating the work of the other stylistic li li uh, leaders of the time, the, mostly the Hudson River School uh, artists, but especially in his drawings and sketches, we can already see the formation of a more mature technique. In the 1860s, seeking subject matter, uh, this is the, uh, in 1860, uh, seeking subject matter that had not yet been addressed by others, he took his first artistic trip, traveling to the wilds of Lake Superior in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan to see the famed pictured rocks, which had been the setting for Longfellow's recent epic poem, Hiawatha. The area, which is still quite remote today, is a dramatic coastline and Moran made it the focal point of a number of drawings and several paintings and illustrations. Sometime in the 1850s, early 1850s, Thomas and his brother Edward began studying painting with a Philadelphia painter named James Hamilton, who introduced them to the art of the great British landscape painter, Joseph Mallard William Turner. Having only Turner's prints to study in the United States, the two Moran brothers traveled to England in 1862 expressly to study Turner's paintings, and this trip was formative for Thomas. He adopted Turner's luminous coloristic effects, especially the vivid complementary tones of blues and yellows, combinations he would later put to dramatic use in Yellowstone. By 1870, Moran had been making a living as an artist for nearly two decades, but he had not yet produced the truly distinctive work that would elevate him to the forefront of his profession. Frederick Church and Albert Bierstadt's phenomenal success with the large landscape, such as the Bierstadt that we saw earlier in the 1850s and 60s, had not escaped Moran's attention. These were selling for tens of thousands of dollars. But Moran lacked both the means and opportunity to experience novel subject matter. With the inauguration of a new magazine, however, Scribner's Monthly, in 1870, he found a new client and almost immediately the cherished opportunity to travel and gain access to new artistic material. The impetus was a commission to illustrate a two-part article for the June-July Oh, sorry, May and June of 1871 issues of Scribner's entitled The Wonders of Yellowstone, written by Nathaniel Langford, who had traveled through the region the previous summer with what was called the Washburn Doan Expedition. And for his published images, Moran worked from untutored drawings by two members of that party. Here you see just one example, uh, the sort of primitive looking sketch by these amateur soldier draftsmen they just drew them, uh, not commissioned, and then the revised version that Moran did, kind of working up and bettering those pictures for publication. So it's interesting to note that Moran actually sketched Yellowstone before he actually traveled there, and surely this project piqued his interest in seeing the region for himself. The Scribner's reports, the articles, and the lecture tour by Langford throughout the East in 1870-71 fueled interest in Yellowstone. And by June, when the Scribner article was, fin uh, was finished and issued, the federal government and the Northern Pacific Railroad, which was planning its route at the time from Minnesota to Puget Sound, had decided that more information was needed about this mysterious place. Ferdinand Hayden's U.S. Geological and Geographical Survey of the Territory set its sights that summer on the region and accepted the Northern Pacific Railroad's 
uh, suggestion, there's the Northern Pacific Railroad line. You can see it going from Minneapolis-St. Paul all the way out to uh, the Pacific Coast, and it doesn't actually touch Wyoming, but gets close enough to run a spur line, which did happen later when the line was finished in 1883. So the Northern Pacific was very interested, and again, it's, it's all kind of mysterious as to how this all took place, but clearly uh, it was the Northern Pacific Railroad that proposed to Hayden that they take along, that the survey take along this guest artist, Thomas Moran. There you see one of a couple of letters, one that Moran carried with him and one that was sent to Hayden uh, from the Northern Pacific office. And it says, um, I invite you to um, take Mr. Moran. He's an artist, a landscape painter of much genius who desires to take Yellowstone uh, sketches in the Yellowstone. And then if you turn the page, it says that he will surpass Mr. Bierstadt, we firmly believe. With a loan from $500 from Scribner's, which wanted more illustrations for future articles, and another $500 from the railroad that was planning its route, Moran ventured west for the first time and became the first painter to visit Yellowstone. This experience was utterly transformative, providing Moran with that novel subject matter he had been seeking, and certainly the opportunity for adventure, and eventually quite a lot of fame. As we've already seen, William Henry Jackson was his cohort on this summer expedition. They worked very, very closely together, visiting all of the major sites, and clearly they benefited from each other's expertise and insights, uh, as we've already heard from our previous speaker, I think that Moran certainly helped Jackson with compositional um, strategies and had in mind that he would have access, which he did, to the photographs later uh, so that he could, at his leisure in his New York studio, paint the pictures using the photographs as reference, although he did make, as we'll see, uh, some field sketches. and. As well, uh, Moran benefited from the photographs. Jackson benefited from Moran's quite uh, lengthy history and expertise in the history of landscape painting by that point. So as we look uh, briefly at just some of the comparisons, um, this is just one of several. We've already seen some lovely Jackson photographs of Mammoth Hot Springs, and I've got some of the contemporary recent photographs to just give you a, a glimpse of the flavor of it. The great combination of an important aspect of the combination of the photographs and the sketches or the ultimate watercolors that Moran made when especially people back east were seeing them was that as great as those photographs were, as verifiable and realistic as they were, they certainly uh, verified that these places are real. They really look like that. They lacked the ingredient of color, and in Yellowstone, color is so primary to the effect of the place. Moran's work could add that, and so there's a synergism between the photographs and the paintings that neither could sustain alone, but you put the two together, and people were just blown away. This place really exists, and it is the most extraordinarily colorful and exotic place we can possibly imagine. So it was a dynamic duo, certainly, as we've already uh, sort of mentioned. Uh, there are endless numbers of these combinations of sites, uh, sort of a tour through the park today that we could uh, look at, and certainly I have a bazillion of them, but I'll just run through a few quickly. This is the Liberty Cap. There's a wonderful painting by Bierstadt in the Inspiring Sites exhibition of the Liberty Cap somewhat later. But here you see a recent photograph of the site there's actually Thomas Moran climbing around in a Jackson photograph, and then two of Moran's field sketches from 1871. The exhibition upstairs also in, uh, contains several of these field sketches from 1871 borrowed from the National Park Service in uh, Yellowstone. So this is quite a, a treat to have those here today. And then uh, another one, Tower Falls. There you see clearly the two men sitting side by side with Jackson photographing Tower Falls, Moran making a, a simple monochromatic uh, sepia colored sketch. And then back east in the fall and winter and then later as well, he did a lot of studio watercolors. This is one of those where he clearly heightened the coloration of the uh, formations. 
he was, in a very Turnerian sense, quite a colorist, and sometimes took a bit of artistic liberty with that, but certainly that is one of his uh, most dramatic aspects. The Tower of Tower Falls, this is one of my favorite formations because I took that photograph um, illegally climbing over the banister and almost falling in the creek to get the angle of it. And Jackson's photograph there and then Moran's view. This is actually the uh, Tower Falls. If you are up there and at the creek bed, just as it plummets over, those towers are what you're seeing in this version. The water is about to go over the... Uh, the brink. This is the foot of his satanic majesty, the devil's hoof, as Langford uh, entitled it, and we'll hear more about that momentarily. And just a couple more. There's the uh, castle geyser, and as we saw before, the Jackson photograph, slightly different angle and very colorful, the Moran watercolor. This was in the 72 uh, aftermath of the expedition, and then a different angle, recent photograph of the formation. The, Moran called this the Great Blue Spring. It is on the route today, but today it's called the Excelsior Geyser in the Firehole area. And before we go on with that, I will uh, pause briefly here. So in the fall and winter after the historic 1871 summer expedition, the idea that Yellowstone should be designated the first national park emerged, and there's lots of discussion about how that happened, but certainly through the combined efforts of Jay Cook of the Northern Pacific Railroad, he was the CEO of the company and very interested in a tourist attraction that could make money for his railroad. Congressman William Derrick Kelly, who you see there on the right, Cook is in the middle, and survey leader Fernand Hayden, and also, the Scribner's Monthly editors were involved. They got Hayden to write a new article, got Moran to do some new sketches, and there is that, um, that issue. The role of art in this process is noteworthy, since Yellowstone was so unlike anything that anyone in the East had ever seen or imagined, visual images took on a special importance in conveying the area's distinctiveness. They also played a role in actually transforming the way Yellowstone was perceived. In the first Scribner's monthly articles, Nathaniel Langford had characterized many of the region's features as eerie and satanic, intriguing to be sure, but hardly the sort of place that would attract visitors to a park. In other words, who wants to go to vacation to hell? Firehole River and the Witch's Cauldron and the Devil's Hoof and the Satan's Sly. This is not exactly, you know, inviting to take your family. Um, so through the lobbying process in the winter of 71 into 72, lobbying Congress, Yellowstone's identity in the, in the written materials and certainly as we'll see in the visual materials that emerged Increasingly, it became described as Wonderland, a word that had special magic since Lewis Carroll's recent book about Alice's trip through the looking glass was an international sensation at the time, but also because the Yellowstone of Moran's watercolors was entrancing, a shimmering vision of exotic terrain that intrigued and beguiled. Yellowstone became Wonderland, in almost all of the subsequent promotional writing and advertising, especially that of the Northern Pacific Railroad, which became the primary route to the park by 1883. It was a shrewd publicity campaign that had enormous effect. Moran's watercolors and Jackson's photographs were fundamental to this transformation, and the passage of the park bill, uh, which occurred finally, was signed into law on March 1st, 1872, and for this alone, Moran would be remembered. But in the months after the park bill, um, after the, sorry, after the expedition, he began painting a massive canvas, the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, a giant seven by 12 foot magnum opus, his first big picture, as he called it, that celebrated the area's most dramatic feature. Just to give you a sense of how big this is, here is the Smithsonian uh, staff moving it, uh, and you can see just how enormous it is. The frame alone is 16 inches wide all the way around. 
The work was unveiled, I'll go back, uh, in New York just weeks after the Park Bill was signed. Sometimes in the literature you'll read that this picture was influential on the Park Bill. It was not because it was not finished. It was in New York. Nobody saw it until after the Park Bill was signed. But it did not affect the legislation, but knowing of the historic action, Moran was thrilled, of course, that this had happened. He immediately shipped the painting to Washington, D.C., and offered it for sale to Congress. As a celebration of the country's embrace of its new wonderland in the West, the work was acquired for the substantial sum of $10,000 and hung immediately in the U.S. Capitol. This was the first American landscape painting uh, by an American artist to be so honored and established Moran's fame. Had he done nothing else, he would be remembered for this achievement alone and certainly for his contributions as the first artist of Yellowstone. I'd like for uh, just a moment to pause and consider this picture a little bit more thoroughly. Today in Yellowstone, I'm sure many of you, most of you have probably been there, along the route at the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone is Artist Point. And at Artist Point, there is a placard with a reproduction of this picture. And it's long been assumed that the painting was at least sketched. The idea for the picture was uh, essentially planned, made at that site. If we look closely at the site and at the picture, we can see that it's not just a matter of artistic liberties. It's an interesting process that Moran worked through in constructing this picture back in New York in his studio, using his field sketches, using Jackson's photographs. And it's really a composite picture that makes us rethink about this idea about painters sitting in one place and painting a finished picture or even envisioning a finished picture. So if we look closely, first of all, this massive picture does have some interesting details. There are some figures in the foreground, uh, probably Hayden, along with a Native American up there on the promontory. There is no record that they ever encountered any Native Americans in this area, so that's completely imported, sort of fictitious addition, but one that I think is highly allegorical and symbolic in the sense that Hayden looks out at the canyon and beckons to it. The Native American essentially turns his back to the canyon and looks at us, almost as if to metaphorically uh, leave the place, maybe to uh, sort of invite us in uh, to this new spectacle. And then over here to the left, we see a couple of horses and um, Moran seated, sketching, and Jackson there standing. So the team that essentially brought this place to the view of the Eastern audiences and to America more generally are there positioned in the foreground. Uh, Moran did alter a number of interesting things or import some interesting things. And one is this big tree on the left. He carefully framed the view with uh, framing devices. And one of them is this big tall tree, which is based on a sketch from the Borghese Gardens in Rome from 1867 that he used as a sort of stock device that he added whenever he needed an interesting tree. The canyon itself is located there. Uh, you can see the arrow. And uh, this is, you know, everybody here knows where Yellowstone is, but back in Iowa, I have to explain to my students, you know. Um, there's the canyon, and certainly you see the aerial view. The artist's point is right here. There's that little parking area. And so the view of it from that point is presumably what we are seeing in the canyon, in the, in the painting. But when you take a photograph from Artist Point and you look at the painting, they're really rather different. Some interesting differences in particular, not only did Moran add the secure foreground, the Borghese Italian tree, the rocks on the right, and really accentuated that white sort of castle rock feature, but notice the especially sloping smooth cliff walls or canyon walls and how rugged they are in actuality. Very curious. He wasn't that bad a painter. In sorting through Jackson's photographs, the answer is revealed. 
There are other views, such as this one from on the other side of the river, that might have had a factor there. But this one in particular shares with the painting the rocks on the right, but more noticeably the sloping walls of the canyon itself. But there's something important that's missing. The waterfall is not there. And if you look carefully at the river, the river is flowing that way, not this way. This picture was taken at the top of the falls looking downriver. And Moran has essentially inverted the whole view. He's taken this array of elements on the right there and then added in the foreground, the framing devices, and the waterfall. It's a constructed vision. This was not at all unusual. In fact, this was the prescribed method for 19th century landscape painters, particularly dictated by John Ruskin, the preeminent English theorist of the day, who essentially told artists to go out, sketch nature, be as truthful as possible in all the parts, but then remove yourself back to your studio, let the veil of artistic temperament and philosophy and intellectual understanding sort of invoke the spirit of the place, and then you had the ability to somewhat combine at will, always being faithful to what he called the true impression of the place. And this was really Moran's fundamental premise, his fundamental approach to the place. He felt that that process, even though it resulted in something that strictly is not correct, evoked the better sense of the fullness of it all. We're seeing from multiple points of view all at once. And that was the true impression that Moran hoped to achieve. The picture was an enormous success. Um, written about very widely and ultimately hung in the U.S. Capitol um, from the time it was purchased until the 1950s when essentially they needed the space. They shipped it over to the Department of the Interior. And then in the 1960s when the what's now the Smithsonian American Art Museum opened, it was transferred there and there it remains. Um, still very much a feature of our national life. Moran, uh, in the year, the months and years, actually, after the 1871 expedition, did countless versions of all of the various places in Yellowstone that he had visited, saw in Jackson's photographs and his sketches. This was one of his favorite subjects that he recurred, re recurred in his work over and over and over again. He did several sets of finished studio watercolors, and these are really gems that uh, are kind of the fullest achievement beyond the big pictures of his understanding of Yellowstone and all of its glories. There are several of those in the exhibition, so I invite you to look at those. Um, all of these have been s sort of scattered, except for one. There is one set that is intact, still 16 watercolors, called the Blackmore set that's today at the Gilcrease. But Jay Cook had a set, uh, Blackmore had a set, and, as we'll see in a moment, Louis Prang, a publisher in Boston, commissioned a set as well. But there you get kind of an overview of Moran's varied uh, visions of Yellowstone. Louis Prang was very excited by all of the hoopla surrounding the park, the celebration of this new Western wonderland, the expansion of American consciousness into the West and all of its excitement and romance, and certainly, too, anticipating in the aftermath of the park bill the oncoming date of 1876, which was the 100th anniversary of the country, uh, the centennial of the United States, Louis Prang, who was a preeminent publisher in Boston of chromolithographs, the state-of-the-art color reproduction prints of the day, commissioned Moran in 1873 to create one of these watercolor sets, like I just showed you, from which he had made uh, chromolithographs, which I'll show you in a moment, are very fine, very arduously constructed 
color reproductions of these prints, I mean, of these watercolors. And he issued them in a very lavish portfolio. It's a big box set about this tall by about that big. These were all mounted on boards. And this was issued with several pages of text by Ferdinand Hayden, uh, very lavish production, and displayed for the first time at the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia. So these were for, again, those people who could only see the black and white Scribner's illustrations and really would have liked to have seen the real watercolors or the big paintings but couldn't travel to see them. This was a way that the average person in the United States might have had access to the wonderful pictures of Thomas Moran. Just to explain very briefly the um, chromolithographic process, today color reproduction is done with four colors only. A full color reproduction is only four colors of printing ink in it. But even so, a printing press can only print one color at a time. So a plate has to be made for the yellow, another one for the red, another one for the blue, and then the last one is the black. But that was a modern technology. In this technique, uh, first really kind of popularized in the 1860s, it was really in its heyday in the 1870s, all of these plates were hand drawn. So um, a man called a chromiste would take the original painting and literally draw by hand a plate that would print only the yellows and only the reds and, and another one for only the yellow, the, the blues and another the browns and so forth. It was not as sophisticated and so many, many more plates were needed. The finest chromolithographs, which this set is in fact one of, uses upwards of 50 different lithographic stones or lithographic plates to make a single color image. It's kind of daunting. Uh, so you're seeing here the building of the image, nine colors there. There's the, the single color for the tenth plate. It gets added. There you see the 10 cumulative. I'm skipping then into 20. Finally, this was 44 colors. And I'm going to show you the, the original painting. This is not obviously a Yellowstone site, but this is a Moran. There's the painting from which it was made. There's the chromolithograph. And, you know, to our modern eyes, it's not really so wonderful. I think over time the blues have faded and it's become more yellowed with age. Uh, I think in, in its original form it would have been more in keeping coloristically to the original painting. The softness of the painting is lost in that redrawing process. But ultimately, you got a color print that was pretty darn good. And downstairs in that exhibition, there is a Prang chromo from this set. So take a look at that. That will really show you uh, just how wonderful these prints were. There's the whole set of the 15 chromolithographs that were produced in 1876. They are exceptionally fine versions of this uh, printing process and very underappreciated today, although this particular set became extremely rare because there was a fire at the Prang factory and burned most of the set before it ever sold, uh, which made this particular set infinitely more valuable. Today, you can't even hardly buy these, and if they are sold, they are reproductions, but they sell in the tens of thousands of dollars. There's the Philadelphia uh, catalog and so forth that, that uh, included mention of these. And I'm just trying to give you a little sense of the aftermath of Moran's career in Yellowstone. He went on to become called the father of the national parks as an artist because he painted so many other national park sites, most notably the Grand Canyon. He followed up his Hayden expedition in 71 with a trip with John Wesley Powell in 1873 visiting both Utah and Zion, what became Zion National Park, and the Grand Canyon. And when he returned from that trip, painted another 7 by 12 foot painting, this one, called The Chasm of the Colorado. A little bit of a confusing title, but it's the Colorado River here, the Great Canyon of the Colorado River. It, too, joined the Yellowstone picture at the Capitol for another $10,000, uh, remaining together even today, now at the Smithsonian. 
He went in the wake of that wonderful expedition of Jackson's that photographed the Mountain of the Holy Cross in Colorado in 1873. Moran saw that photograph and said, I've got to see that for myself, and went with the Hayden expedition again in 1874 to see this mountain for himself. He came back and painted this work five by seven feet and exhibited it at the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia, a wonderful commemoration of Manifest Destiny, the sort of God-given providence that had given us this incredible country, and also, of course, the uh, founding of Colorado as a state that year. And the three pictures really form what I think of as, as Moran's sort of magnanimous opic, uh, epic opus triptych, uh, this three-panel uh, sequence that is his fullest expression of the grandeur of the American West, but Yellowstone, of course, was at the beginning of all of that. In conclusion, Moran went on to paint many different places that were national parks well into the early 20th century. He lived until 1926. He went out to the Grand Canyon after the railroad was established there in 1901, nearly every year, uh, trading paintings for free passage on the uh, Santa Fe Railway, Railway line and free lodging at the El Tovar Hotel. Um, but certainly he painted many other sites of the national parks as well. So he uh, kind of earned his name, the father of the national parks. He went back to Yellowstone only one more time in 1892, and there you see him photographed on the brink, now a scenic overlook, essentially the promontory he had established as the best artistic view. And he went home and painted another great picture, this time 10 by 14 feet, uh, which re-encapsulated, re-imagined his 1872 great picture that had brought him his initial fame. He touched it up again, you can see 1893, touched it up in 1904, and it was purchased by uh, George Pratt and given to the Smithsonian. So today, all three of those pictures the two Yellowstone paintings and the Grand Canyon picture I showed you hang together in a special room at the Smithsonian. It's really something to see if you've never been there. Uh, certainly his later work, the 1893 picture, is softer, more romantic. He was a mature artist at this point. He had encountered Impressionism. There's a softness to it. And he lo no longer had the responsibility of convincing people that this place really existed. There isn't that meticulous detail. It's a much more uh, kind of full expression of his artistic temperament. Really quite an honor to the place that is Yellowstone. Thank you.